Good evening and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Our guest speaker is a man that has been the force behind the adipose-derived stem cell research for several years. Dr. Paspalieris has published over 20 papers and has given over 50 lectures regarding stem cell medicine. He has been presented with three Young Investigator Awards for his scientific accomplishments, and he was knighted by the Greek Orthodox Church for his humanitarian accomplishments. He also received an appreciation award from the American Academy of Clinical Endocrinologists for his work on stem cell research in diabetes type 2. He knows firsthand the stories, the challenges, and the little known secrets behind this very promising field of modern medicine. Not only that, but he's also a very entertaining speaker. Please join me on giving the warmest welcome to Dr. Vasilis Paspaliaris. Thank you very much uh, for your being here. Um, that was a gr very great introduction for myself. It's one of the best ones I've heard. But um, I'm just like any other average person who works at something and uh, what we can, uh, I'm sure you've all accomplished something in your lifetimes, but I, I really appreciate that introduction. So I'm, it's a pleasure to be here and, um, and a pleasure to show some of the work we've been doing over the last um, six years. And so what I'll mostly talk about is the work we've done as Adistem. Adistem is a biotech company that's uh, based out of Hong Kong. Our R&D facilities are in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I don't look Australian. I am Australian, but uh, I am Greek in terms of heritage. And, uh, and so we've taken this technology to various parts of the world, worked with various groups of different specialties in the, in the medical world, and so it's a little bit of a story. I'm going to try, it's a very long story, so I'm going to try and cut it as short as I can without l leaving some of the juicy bits out. So I'll talk mostly, you've, you've heard a lot about stem cells in the media, you read a lot about stem cells. Some of you may even work with bone marrow transplants or hematopoietic stem cells, you've, you've, you've probably worked hard. So I'll be mostly t discussing about our observations, those of others, and where this field is sort of leading to, in particularly in the, in the clinical setting. So basically what we're doing with adipose tissue, and I'll go over this in far more detail, is adipose tissue is a very, very rich source of progenitor cells. The stromal vascular fraction of adipose tissue is very rich. And because it's very rich, it's um, it gives us the ability where we do not have to expand cells, where we can, uh, we, we can do the particular therapy as a single setting. And this is, this is quite promising. It's, it's really no more different than platelet-rich plasma setting, where we take platelets out of blood and put them in, a, in an area in the body, clot them and put them in an area in the body. So we're trying to keep that same, that same philosophy, autologous treatment as a single setting, from the patient back to the patient in front of the doctor. Um, this was originally made for military use. So what we were trying to use is something, what can we use where we do not need a GMP laboratory or a licensed laboratory, which is a very expensive setup, which you cannot mobilise around on a battlefield, so to speak, something for wound healing that we could use very early on, and I'll explain some of that. So basically, it's a mini liposuction we take uh, with a very small cannula. Uh, we take a uh, little bit of adipose tissue, lipoaspirate, we use the fact that lipid will always go up to the top and water will go down to the bottom. So we use the principle of gravity to separate and the principle of emulsifying fat or, or getting rid of the lipid containing cells, otherwise known as adipocytes, and try and separate that using centrifugation. We then looked at various parameters as most of these cells are in a dormant state. And they're far more dormant in a 90-year-old than they will be in a 4-year-old, and they're far less of them. So this is a very important factor when you look at the clinical setting. Age is a very important factor. And so we looked at various ways of how can we non-invasively turn these cells from an, S1, an S0 to an S1 phase to get them to embed more, in, implant more, to get them to secrete more of their plethora of growth factors that they secrete. 
and then look at the clinical setting of how to administer and for what reason to administer back to a patient. So I'll try not to bore you too much with what is a stem cell, but basically a stem cell is as it says, the stem of something. It's a stem cell means it can renew itself and it can turn into it can differentiate into another tissue. So it's something that is constantly present in our body. Um, what's mostly talked about is embryonic stem cell, and they talk about its ability to differentiate in terms of potency or potent. So when they say it's multipotent. It's, it means that it's an em pluripotent, means that it's something that can turn into anything. And one of the issues with embryonic stem cells, outside of its moral and ethical issues as far as religious concerns are, con uh, are restrained, is really the fact that if it can turn into anything, it can turn into a teratoma. So this is one issue they, as of yet, it's a, it's a very powerful tool, but it's a Pandora's box. So it's still being in the research phase, and they're still looking at it. Once again, it's not an autologous issue. It's, it's something derived from outside your body. So these are things that will take a long time to be uh, with a lot of research and safety data. Adult stem cells, and what we mean by adult stem cells, something that's taken out of after you're born, um, is something we consider to be something that's already differentiated a couple of steps. It can't go back to becoming an embryonic stage. And I'll show some data showing that these cells when we put them in, do not really turn into tissue. It's, it's the idea that these stem cells go into an area and they turn into tissue. Well, they don't really turn into tissue. There's very, very little of them that you, there's very little evidence to suggest it does that in vivo in, a, in the body. But there's a lot of evidence that you know, they secrete a plethora. They're like multi-drug de delivery vehicles. They secrete a plethora of growth factors which induce the local area to heal itself. In one area, they f when we talk about mesenchyme stem cells, the, the other thing about adult stem cells, they're split into two types. We talk about hematopoietic stem cells. It's what's commonly used as a bone marrow transplant. You get a lot of them out of the bone marrow. These cells will go and induce an immune system. They will then they will turn to induce, and mostly used post-chemo, post-radiation, high levels to, as a rescue remedy. Mesenchyme stem cells are your tissue stem cells, and I'll talk about them. They're the ones we're interested in. The sources, every organ in the body has a progenitor cell, has a, has a particular mesenchyme stem cell that's, that's directed towards turning something into a, a, a liver cell or a kidney cell or so forth, epithelial, endothelial. But um, as far as the sources are concerned, peripheral blood, bone marrow, and now adipose tissue are the three, three areas that you'll mostly see published work on. It's, an, it's very easy to get blood, as we all know. There's just very little of the cells there, which means we have to expand to get to a therapeutic threshold. There's a bit more in the bone marrow, but still we have to expand. And expansion means laboratory culture. It also means, is it considered minimal manipulation? So it's a question that's raised by a lot of health regulations. Um, and then, of course, there's adipose tissue where we get 10,000 times more. And when you're looking at those levels, well, Liposuction, there's, correct me if I'm wrong, there's about 3.2 million done in the US from last time I look at the ISAPs board. But uh, it's something that's routinely done. A mini liposuction is, is something done under local anesthesia is something that is, is quite uh, doable. So when we look at the mesogenic process, and sorry for the people further out in the back, but basically we're looking at the mesenchyme stem cells is what triggers for connective tissue, ligaments, Bone marrow, of course, marrow stromal cells, skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, cartilage, osteocytes, osteoblasts, and so forth. So this is what these are the type of things we're looking at. We've said about bone marrow and adipose tissue. Um, when we looked at adipose tissue, and this is some work done by a Korean colleague, <coughs> where do these cells lie? Where do these CD31, which is mostly looked at, CD34, the CD31 cells <coughs> lie? And where they seem to lie, and there's a lot more research done lately and published, is they seem to be mostly around the blood vessels in the fat. Fat is a highly perfused tissue. It's highly perfused, hence why do we give subcutaneous injections and get, and get a drug into the bloodstream. Um, it's a highly perfused tissue. It's a, it's, it's, it's a metabolic tissue that is highly active. It's not just an insulator. And there's a lot more work because of the latest ability of research to be able to, uh, new technology that's come out that researchers are able to look at it much. 
it used to be considered it's just fat, it insulates us from heat. Well, no, we're finding adipocytes secrete what's known as adi adi adikines or cytokines derived from adipose tissue, completely regulating insulin resistance. Um, weight gain. It's a highly metabolic tissue. There's a high turnover. Every two to ten years, depending on our age, we turn over fat. The levels are kept the same. It's just the lipid content in adipocyte that changes. So because of that high me metabolic rate, that high turnover, there is a plethora of stem cells in that area for that constant upheaval. So it's a very, very important tissue. What proved that these were adipose-derived mesenchyme stem cells? The way to prove that a stem cell is a stem cell is that in vitro, outside the body, they can be turned into other cells. So the, there's a, a lot of work done in, back in 2004, 2005. You might see two or three papers on adipose-derived progenitor cells or stromal cells. If you look on, if you uh, go to PubMed or Medline now, you will see hundreds upon hundreds of publications. So a lot of groups are turning towards fat because of its ability that it's such a rich source of these cells. Um, they'll turn into endothelial cells, they'll further turn into adipose cells. So you can take these, you can culture them, you can turn them into nerve cells, you can turn them into uh, beta islet cells and so forth. And that's what proves that a cell is a stem cell, it can self renew and you can turn it into a tissue. So what we wanted to see is what is really the physiological role of stem cells in the body? I mean, we must understand their physiology in order to appreciate how to use them clinically. We can't just say it's a stem cell and it's going to grow a new arm. I mean, it's not as easy as that. And, and, and so what we know so far is that a stem cell is a repair cell. It's, a, it's an ambulance. Think of it as an ambulance. We cut ourselves or we injure ourselves. We get platelets running to the area, part of the injury cascade. These platelets release a plethora of different types of growth factors, chemokines and so forth, that induce a response from the bone marrow to mobilise, to activate dormant stem cells, to mobilise into the periphery and to go into that area to heal. That is part. Now the system works great on a four-year-old, not so good on a 94-year-old. And so they've looked at various things as what does attract a stem cell to a region. They know hypoxia is one, some other factors, platelet-derived growth factor is another one now, hepatocyte growth factor, and of course platelets have all this inside. When we look at age, and this is taken from uh, Dr. Kalpin, who's, who's done a fair bit of work on mesenchyme stem cells from bone marrow, it's a huge drop. You start with, when we look at a colony forming unit assay, something similar to what they do with bacteria. You, you plate them and you see how many colonies are formed. Or well, it's a similar assay, you take a population of stem cells and see how many colonies form. It's a way of saying how many active stem cells were there in the population compared to dormant. And if we take some bone marrow, from a newborn, a teen, a 30, 50, and an 80 year old, we're looking at a, a huge drop in function, a huge drop in injury cascade. Now with fat, we're doing the work as we speak, you don't see such a big drop, but you do see a drop. So this is an important thing to look at clinically when I'm taking out some lipoaspirate, am I going to have the same result on a 90 year old, or will I have the same result on a, on a 10 year old? Similarly, there's less bone marrow you can appreciate to be taken out. When we had a group of, uh, there was a formal clinical trial run in, in Thessalonica in Greece with a group of cardio surgeons when they looked at post -my myocardial infarct to look at bone marrow, can we take the bone marrow from these patients and put it back into the area of the infarct? The problem was it was older individuals, we couldn't get enough cells and so the trial was stopped. So this is a very important thing. It's all great in the lab but when you take it into a clinical setting, these are various things we must consider. Some great work done by Mary Rose et al. is published about four really good papers which look at if I take these stem cells or these adipose-derived stem cells and I inject them, human, inject them into a nude mouse, and they're not nude because they don't have any clothes, they're nude, their immune system is uh, competent in taking anything, they don't really have, a, they've got a knocked out immune system. So we can put human cells in there and trace where the human cells just by looking at DNA in the organs. So this is a, a great study, one of his original studies where he's taken a million adipose mesenchyme stem cells, he's given it in different modes of administration and he found with intravenous, if we go back to these mice 
75 days later, we see that there's not much in the peripheral blood, not much in the bone marrow, but we see spleen, we see uh, pancreas, kidney, liver, a lot in the lung, because they're pretty big cells, human, if you put them into a mouse, so a lot of them by IV will get trapped in the lung. Um, the skeletal muscle, now most of interest is they found it in the brain. So it suggests these cells cross the blood-brain barrier and in cardiac tissue. And these results have been repeated by other groups. Subcutaneous administration, interestingly, is you've got a little bit more in the liver and less in the lung. So, and the, and the distribution was the same. When they looked at, um, looking at these cells, okay, we inject them in, where do they go? Are they attracted to areas of damage? Yes, they are. You'll see a majority of cells just zoom into areas of damage. So it's, once again, their physiological role. If I give them back by IV, are they just going to go and implant everywhere? Or will they home into these areas of damage? 